Hello, and welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics in work and in life and simplify them. And friends, all this month, we have been talking about a very important topic, one of discernment. It might actually be the most important topic this year, though, you know, ask me in a month, maybe next month will also be incredibly important. But discernment is important because a thousand daily choices that we make, this is how we create a quality life. And a lot of times we find ourselves either in our work or in our life kind of enduring painful moments, painful points that, you know, uh, keep us blocked from where we actually want to go in our careers, where we actually want to go in our love lives or otherwise. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about and identify and actually do something about the pain points in your life. So my special guest today, her name is Eleanor Beaton, and she is the founder of Safi Media, an education and coaching company for women entrepreneurs. Through Safi Media and her podcast, Power Presence Position, Eleanor and her team are committed to advancing global gender equity through women's entrepreneurship. She's advised Canada's Deputy Prime Minister on women's entrepreneurship. She's also been featured in Forbes, The Globe, and Mail, The Atlantic, and the CBC. So I'd like to welcome to the Simplifiers podcast, Eleanor Beaton. Hey, Eleanor. It's so awesome to be here with you, Mary. It's such a pleasure. And, you know, a lot of people are going to go like, great, we're talking about pain. Uh, click, next. <laughs> next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to go to the other one. Where, where is the, the episodes on fun and adventure? Let's go back to there. But why is it so important to acknowledge the pain points that we have in our career and in our non-work lives? Because undiscerned pain is like carrying a 20 pound backpack that you forget is there. And without that discernment that we're going to talk about today, you as a leader, as a parent, as one half of a really powerful relationship, Mm. you are operating at 50, 60% Mm. of what you could be when you truly take the time to discern and process pain in order to make really powerful changes and often streamline and simplify Mm -hmm. your life. It's critical. Do you think that this is a gender issue? Do you think that men or non-binary suffer from this just as much as women do? What are your thoughts? I do. I think that this is definitely a part of the human condition. But I will say that as in our culture, as nurturers, as people who are conditioned and socialized to ensure that everybody else feels okay before we feel okay, there is a certain amount of socialization that happens in our culture that I think disproportionately impacts women. I couldn't agree more. Um, And I think it's one, one of those things where you, when you wake up to the matrix and you realize that it's been built around you. Um, and as you say, you've been carrying the backpack for so long, you, you know no different. You just yeah. grew up as a child in this environment that has evolved and, and changed over time. And certainly some things have gotten better over time. Um, but still, it's, it's there. So yeah. why do you think we avoid acknowledging it? Like, why, <laughs> why is that? Is it just because our brains are pain averse? So I'm going to make a couple of assumptions here. I'm going to make the assumption that if you're listening to the Simplifiers podcast, you are a particular sort of person. So I'm sure there are incredibly diverse people listening to this show, but who listens to podcasts that are really designed to provide tools to help you be more efficient, to help you be a better decision maker, to help Mm. you be more successful, This podcast, I suspect, is being listened to by people like us who care about our future, who want to unlock our full potential, um, and who want to get better. So what happens? And when I think about what we have gone through, I know I've certainly gone through this. I'm sure you have. We have had to cultivate the quality known as grit, (laughs) which is a fantastic quality 
you know, and it basically means putting our sometimes immediate comfort or immediate gratification, putting like subverting that in order to create a better, more prosperous, more abundant future. Yeah. Right. So whether it was not hanging out with friends on Friday night, uh, because you had a big test on Monday, whether it is not eating all of the cake, but going for a walk instead, whether it is not ordering that second glass of wine with dinner, like whatever it is, many high performers, high potential people cultivate a strong sense of grit. And that can push them into territory that I call the grit quandary, Mm. where our muscles and our ability to withstand discomfort, which has been so important and useful and powerful in our lives thus far, and can still be important and powerful and useful, can actually dull our senses to discomfort or pain that signals important shifts need to happen. Mm, that's so interesting. And I think you're right. And and I think that to add on to that layer, and I'm curious what your thoughts are, sometimes we lean over in the unhealthy side and wear that as a badge of honor. Like, look at me. I am holding so much. I am withholding so much. Like, is that a part of this as well? Oh, I absolutely think so, especially in our culture. I mean, I think that we, especially post-pandemic, in the post-pandemic world, we, which was a huge eye-opener yes. to the kind of stress and burden, the impact, you know, uh, on people's mental health and, and overall well-being was massive. You know, um, in Canada, one of the most uh, reputable mental health research hospitals and organizations did a landmark study, which found that during the pandemic, one in four women was experiencing moderate to severe anxiety, right? So we, I think as a collective are certainly more aware of the unhealthy hustle, but still North America isn't Europe. Yeah. where they have a little bit more of a, uh, a a stronger, a better, healthier relationship with work ethic. Over here in North America, you know, we definitely can have a somewhat unhealthy relationship with our work ethic and feel guilty, you know, if we are not hustling or feel guilty if we're not working hard enough to yeah. feel exhausted and uncomfortable. Yeah. So I definitely think it's partly cultural. Well, having lived overseas for so long and now back in the States, I can attest that that is in fact true. Um, the majority of entry level corporate positions, you get a minimum of 28 days paid vacation plus bank holidays. So we're talking 30, 40 days in your year that are completely off and not expected for you to be in the office. Match that to here in the States. And I think most corporate companies, you know, if you're talking entry level, apples to apples, you maybe get five days or 10 days tops. Yeah. And so there is quite a few disparities in in the matrix and the culture that we live in that um, are working against us. But I want to go back to your point earlier, because I think that's an interesting one to consider is that some of us might be very consciously avoiding our pain points, <laughs> consciously acknowledge, you know, avoiding acknowledging them because they're like, oh, yeah, I'll just deal with that later. Right. That chronic pain, that uh, weird headache, that um, very strange stress that I'm feeling in my body or in my heart. Um, But then, as you said earlier, like the dullness uh, that you may actually not be aware at all. And it's an unconscious um, avoidance. Is that did I get that right? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll give you an example, um, a very near and dear and immediate present example that I think a lot of people will be able to relate to. So in my house, I have this storage room Mm. and the storage room doubles as a linen closet. So it's where all of our sheets and, and bed covers and all of that stuff are in there. But so too are old toys and Mm. some boxes of Lego and some suitcases and, 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 
I was doing a pain audit on myself. We'll talk about that soon. Yes. I was doing a pain audit on myself. And basically I took a couple of days and I was just allowing myself to sink into a state of sensitivity whereby I was just gently logging all the times throughout my day where I felt like avoiding something where I felt like something made me feel tired. I didn't want to look at something. I didn't want to face something or I just had a hard eye roll, you know, Mm -hmm. so I was just going through and logging these things. And I went down, I wanted some fresh sheets on my bed. And so I went down to the linen closet. I opened the door and immediately I wanted to get in and get out. I did not want to look at this clutter. Mm. It was causing me pain, Mm -hmm. right? Now, I had been experiencing this pain consistently going down to this linen closet for at least four months, right? It didn't seem like a priority. It was just a bit overwhelming. But I noticed, wow, this room causes me discomfort. But what it's really saying is... I am allowing things to pile up. Now, I know as a coach and just as a human being that growth and transformation require space. Yeah. And when we have stuff that's kind of cluttering up our lives um, or it's, it's undigested pain, you know, or undigested, undiscerned discomfort, that starts to create this clutter And it's like, basically, that's just another brick in that backpack. Mm -hmm. So that's an example. You know, there's lots of ways we we can talk about examples in a moment about how it can show up in your business. But I realized, okay, you know, if I want to create the space to um, have a full life where there's space for growth, where I feel prepared and on top of things, it's really important that I face how much I can't take this room right now. Yeah. And I, you know, I mean, I've heard other people speak of, of fear and pain points in the past um, in various ways. And I feel like overarching, it's like you, the first step is that you have to acknowledge it. Um, and it has to be more painful to leave it there as is than, you know, not, right? It ha- the, that At some point, your brain has to click into action to go, okay, th- enough is enough right? Like yeah. you know, something has to change because this is too painful now for me. Or otherwise, we're going to proverbially close the closet door in various Constantly. aspects of our lives and go, ah, that's over there. It's outside of the uh, earshot and eye shot. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about it, right? Um, well, it's also, and you know, I'm going to be very uh, on the point here. Yes. Go it's for it. also, again, for those of us who are listening to this show and taking things on and really trying to enhance ourselves and, and be the kind of people who can positively impact the world. Yes. It's kind of wimpy in the sense that what, what we're actually saying is we're afraid of pain. So we're willing to deal with low level discomfort. Like we're just going to let that linger because we're too chicken (laughs) to look at it. And I can remember learning something years ago, which is that when you have a discomfort, an uncomfortable emotion, and you actually just kind of let yourself feel it, like actually try to feel it, Mm -hmm. like fear, anger, frustration, it usually can only last for about 90 seconds. Yeah. Right. And so we're running around as though our life is a minefield, avoiding things that only somewhat hurt for 90 seconds. Like when I really, when I really looked at that, I was like, okay, okay, I can feel this for 90 seconds and then I can do something about it. Mm. So let's talk about the, what do we do? Um, yeah. Because I think this is incredibly important. So how do we identify those pain points and potential roadblocks in our life that are holding us back from reaching our full pos- potential, you know, whether it's in your work or in your non-work life? Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Okay. So I know you are super organized, Mary, and your listeners appreciate that as do your podcast guests. So I'm going to be very organized about this. Okay. What I suggest is that people conduct what I would call a pain audit. And so what you want to do is to take out a notebook 
you could actually set a timer during your waking hours for sort of every two hours, the timer goes off. And what you do is simply gently review the past couple of hours and pay attention to all the times that you felt uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. that you didn't want to face something, that you delayed doing something that was important to you to do. So the trick here is to not kind of have any judgment about it, not try to figure out what it all means and not try to solve it. But as you indicated earlier, often the very first thing is just to be aware. So that's what we're going to do. And so you just start gently noting down all the things that are currently creating pain, friction, or discomfort in your life. And I really recommend giving yourself one to two days to do this mm. because it it very – like we're so good at avoiding looking at things that you're not necessarily going to have a comprehensive list, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. So just kind of take a look at it. And there's something very powerful at – looking at your life and looking at your days and noticing, becoming aware potentially for the first time of the multiple different areas where you are experiencing pain points. Now, because I work Mm. with entrepreneurs, I'll often have them do this specifically around their business. Mm -hmm. But I think this is sort of useful for, um, you know, you can do this certainly on a, on a more holistic sense. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part. And you simply sit and take a look at these different pain points and just see what you notice, you know, see what you notice. So for instance, I can remember the first time I did this exercise, I noticed how much I was tolerating. And for many of us, and I suspect many of the people who are listening to the show, we're in a place of a lot of agency over our lives. It's not like when you're a kid and you're living in your caretaker's household, you know, under their rules. They are our rules and our rules continue to produce a lot of discomfort and a life that doesn't really fit us. So I think that's like the first thing. And then honestly, it's really going through and choosing one at a time to take a look at and just understand what's going on here. Why don't I want to face this? Mm -hmm. What would happen if I did? And what's a really simple first step I could take to begin to address this underlying problem. Mm, It's very powerful. And I'm sure for some people, a little bit scary, because the second you write something down, I I think for me, when it comes up and out of me, and and then it gets written down on a piece of paper, sometimes the the, there's the fear of if I write it down, it becomes true. But if I hold on to it, and just keep it hidden, then no one notices, including me, which is a mm-hmm. lie, obviously, right? <laughs> uh, we yeah. all notice, and and you know it too. But, you know, I think there is some real power in uh, getting it up and out of you and, and the process of writing it down. And I think a lot of times the things that I'm so afraid of or the things that I think um, I can, uh, you know, push off for another day, week, month, year, uh, once I write it down, I go, well, actually, it's not as scary as I thought it was, <laughs> you know, exactly. It's, it's just that I have been delaying um, or, you know, for other reasons. There's something deeper rooted underneath. What are your thoughts there? Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent, because when we name something, it means we're taking respon- assuming responsibility for it. Right. You know, like that's there's very often a connection there. And so it creates this shift in your life where you go from being a person who is um, passive Mm -hmm. in certain aspects of your life. And that's a tough pill to swallow, again, for lots of the folks who would be listening, myself included, who are leaders and independent and have taken charge and responsibility to be like, wait, there's still more there's still more places in my life where I need to take ownership. Are you serious? But the interesting thing is a lot of times the thing that we're not taking ownership for is our own well-being. Yes. You know, like that's the last thing. And who you become when you become a person who says, you know what, I am going to take my discomfort seriously. I am going to be aware and explore all the places in my life where I feel currently feel discomfort. 
I'm going to decide, is this healthy discomfort, i.e. I am rising to a challenge, or is this unhealthy discomfort that this is actually keeping me small? Mm -hmm. So for instance, like the linen closet thing, keeping me small because it was bothering me. And also I just have this feeling that a leader, you know, this next level of leadership for so many of us is making a home for the things that we hold valuable. Yes. And if we don't hold it valuable, it shouldn't be there, yeah. like making the decision to release it. But I'll give you another example. When I was, this was years ago, when I was first starting to build up my company, my coaching company, I noticed that I had a habit. So when I'd first building my business, when I was first building my business, if somebody reached out that they wanted to work together, Boom. I was like, it, they had an email response from me in like 30 seconds. <laughs> Let's like, it was all organized. I was on it. Mm -hmm. Then I became more successful. I had more clients and all of a sudden I'm like a lot busier and I actually look around. I'm like, while I love my clients and I love this work, I don't like what's happening here. Mm -hmm. I'm working constantly. I don't have time for my kids. I don't have time for my, and so it is inbound requests would come in and I kid you not, Mary, they would stay in my email inbox for days. Yeah. Sometimes it would be a week. Sometimes I would talk to the person and then even delay, they'd, ha they'd have to wait like five days to, to have a call and then they would wait another, or even to hear from me <laughs> to book a call. And then it would be another five days after that call before they got any form of follow-up or proposal. And I realized one day I was like, it's not just that I need help. It's that I don't like this business model. Mm. This business model, I don't want to grow this business model. Yeah. So it's not just about hiring somebody to help me respond to these things. It's if it's, that's not the problem. The real pain point is coming from the way I've structured my business. And that created, you know, a big change in terms of, for me, that meant I had to learn how to start generating my income from my assets and not simply from my labor. And it, that wisdom came from you taking that assessment, identifying that this is a pain point that doesn't line up with your core values or maybe your company's vision or mission statement, right? It Absolutely. was way off. I mean, in essence, your inbox turned into another proverbial linen closet, right? Oh, nice one. Yes, <laughs> it totally did. It, it totally was another linen closet. I I never thought about it that way, but yes, that's it, exactly what it was. And energetically... These things that we have in our life, and my goodness, our inboxes are certainly in our life, we see them multiple times a day, that are feeding our subconscious. This is how we operate. This is the backpack I carry. This is my identity. And I think that that's, that's the big piece of like doing this work um, is, is, you know, realizing that you have the power and, and as you said earlier, the agency to make change. You know, you and I talked about this offline, and I really would love for you to reiterate this with our audience about, you know, the idea of using pain to prune your life. What do you mean by this? And how do we begin to do it? Mm. You know, life produces excess. That's just the nature of life. So I am a gardener. Well, okay, well, this is the royal eye. We, my husband is the gardener and I am the appreciator of the garden. And so for instance, um, in our old house, we planted an apple tree and, um, we planted the apple tree and we pruned it right down because in order, like if you want to create a tree or nurture a tree that bears fruit, mm. the tree will naturally produce too much. All life does. And so in order to be discerning, you're really going to sort of cut stuff back, Yes. right? You're going to cut back so that what you have, you can be very intentional about what you have and it bears fruit. The same is true in all different aspects of life, certainly in business. And what I have noticed is that when we start to identify pain points, do the kind of, again, not try to solve them immediately. That's why I'm saying like, may, do your pain on it and don't rush to solve yeah. because that's just this other thing of not wanting to be in pain. Like just look 
allow yourself to observe and think deeply about what's the underlying issue here. And when you do that, you really are, you are, you start to become able to eliminate problems before they become bigger ones. You're able to discern where am I going to invest my precious attention and resources and where am I not? I'll give you one example, just a super basic, obvious example. I was running a program like a workshop and common thing in if for people in my industry who run workshops is to have a Facebook group. Mm-hmm. So I had a Facebook group and I, and, and people apparently loved it. They would go on, they would post their wins. They would ask questions. They would be asking like about maybe there was some customer service question that they had. And all of a sudden I realize that I am spending multiple hours per week And so then the initial thing is like, you know what, I'm going to hire somebody Mm -hmm. else to do this. No, now you're just throwing money after something that shouldn't be there in the first place. I really did the discernment and I was like, this Facebook group has no purpose. It has no, this needs to be pruned. Yes. So I simply took it away rather than trying to invest more money into it by hiring somebody, um, giving people multiple different places where they can ask questions. I really pruned it down, simplified the business, made my life a lot simpler, made the customer experience a lot clearer. Um, that's an example, right? It was a pain point, but by try, if you try to solve things too fast, you're not actually pruning, you're adding. Yes. And I, I think there's a lot that you said there that I really want to unpack that I think is critically important. For others that are listening that are business owners like um, Eleanor and I, yes, the the initial um, uh, attention that we give to things, especially early on in our business, is that more, 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 more. Give the client the everything and the kitchen sink because when there's more given to them, there's more value perceived, right? It, it's just this kind of, and if you unpack that onion and really peel back the layers, it's kind of probably rooted in insecurity. Like, is this enough? I'm going to give you more totally. just so that you believe that you're really getting your money's worth, right? Now, if you look, going back to what you just said there about customer experience, if you look at this whole equation from the customer's point of view, they're like drinking from a fire hose. They're like, this is too much. Like, I can't even consume all of this wisdom. And certainly not in the timeline that you're giving me. Ah, right. And so they're, they're just sort of taking as much as they can in bits and pieces from here and there. But I love the idea of, of pruning back because when you can refine the product offering, you can refine the deliverables and ultimately get really clear on what their benefits, what they are hoping to get out of working with you, then you realize you don't need to give them all the things, uh, certainly not all at once. And you're actually doing a better service to your customers and clients by just going, here is the one thing you need right now to focus on, not the eight things, and, and you know, pare it down, Right. Yeah. And it takes tremendous courage and presence of mind to do that. And what I have found is that the more I do these kind of pain audits on myself, Mm. the, the lighter I am. So I don't have the backpack anymore. Like my, I mean, I actually do have one, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but it's constantly going down. Like it's constantly going light, lighter and lighter and lighter, which is a good thing. Yes. But that's the place from which then you can discern on behalf of other people. Yeah. Right. And so you become as a leader, a person who can create a very clean container. It's like, you know, when you go to somebody's house and they have really taken the time to be thoughtful about what they have in there. And it's not cluttered and you just feel like you can breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, what would happen if we created lives for ourselves that are like that? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm not suggesting that people, some people just like having stuff all over, but that's, you can still, you know, like it's just exactly what should be there, what's necessary and sufficient Nothing more, nothing less. Yes. That's elegance. And equally, let's say you don't own a business and you work for someone else. I think this applies 100% in the workplace, right? Because you can start to look at what are your weekly responsibilities? What are the things on your plate that are just extraneous or time-consuming or, quite frankly, 
exhausting and not really playing to your strengths. Like, I think it takes a lot of courage to um, approach your your manager or your boss and go, you know what, I really t- took an audit of the work that I do here, and I want to deliver the very best work to you um, and to our customers and clients. Like, can we talk and have an open conversation about this? And, and you know, how can we prune or better use the my time, my expertise, and my resources to accomplish the work, Right. Oh, a hundred percent. And to take that even one step further, you know, Mm. like, so I have eight employees and I will tell you that over time, you know, any sort of growing company, you're just constantly, as you grow, you need different people. Mm. You know, you just do. Yes. And one of the biggest things that I've noticed between the employees who can really help the company grow, and these are the employees that are so valuable and currently everybody on the team is like this. This has not always been the case. Um, not because they weren't fantastic, but it was just wrong person at wrong time, you know, but the team that I have now, the thing that I appreciate so much and you don't want to lose them, you invest in them. You really make sure (laughs) that they are, they, that they have what they need because they're so valuable they are able to simplify and discern. Mm -hmm. They are able to go in and say, you know, I noticed this not just with my workload, but I noticed in this process, we're actually taking a number of steps and I dug into it a little bit and about 30% of the steps we're taking here are actually not necessary. So I was thinking if we take those out, it cuts down the time that we're able, you know, that it takes to do this thing it's going to save some cost, but overall it just simplifies things. What do you think? Yeah. And that is a valuable team member. A hundred percent. And that takes courage. It, it takes sure does. so yes. much uh, courage to step up and say that because I think, you know, I've been in those shoes before where you're too afraid to tell a manager because the second you tell them, they go, well, great. Well, then we're going to fill your plate with 30% other tasks because yes. you're so much more efficient now, right? You know, there's that fear of like, well, I'll just keep coasting because that's what we're doing here, you know? Yeah. And I think that, again, this analogy can be used in a non-work environment, negotiating with your spouse, uh, negotiating with your kids. You know, and talking about like, these are the things that are are painful right now. Mummy does a lot around the house and like, hey, how can we each work and and do a little bit uh, more or cut it back, prune back what we offer? Um, Gosh, it's I just love this. And, and, you know, the it's funny, too. Last month, our our whole theme was radiance, um, shining bright. And we actually had um, Sarah Hagstrom. She's a health coach on. And she had talked also about pruning for progress. And she mm-hmm. was really talking more in the physical body way, like thinking about um, if you are experiencing any sort of chronic pain or otherwise – the pruning process of, again, assessing wh- where does it hurt? What can we do less of rather than adding more to? Um, so I encourage if you guys are listening to this episode and thinking, hey, this this sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Go back to listen to the episode with Sarah Hagstrom. And by the way, everything we talk about in this episode today, it's all in our show notes. It's over at the simplifierspodcast.com. So I want to kind of move on and shift gears a little. So how then do we release these pain points with intentionality in truly a practical way? Because in essence, it's all well and good to identify them. But if we don't actually take action and and cut them today, what's the point? Yeah. Okay. So I'd love to take credit for this one, but I can't because I didn't create it. (laughs) So, uh, Martha Beck, who is an author, she, uh, she taught me this tool and it's called the three B's. So once you've identified now, I, before we even get there, we need to just quickly talk about the difference between good discomfort and bad discomfort or good, good pain and bad pain. And it always comes down to this does when, so the thing that's causing you discomfort, um, does it set you free? Mm. Freedom is something you can always trust. So for example, um, oh, I, I got, uh, this keynote, you know, I, we're back on the keynote stages. So I've got some live keynotes and I need to actually update my talk. Oh, I don't want to do it. 
mm-hmm. you know, okay. So that is when I really did my discernment around that. That's just, I'm just a little uncomfortable about getting up on stages again, you know, mm-hmm. all of this good discomfort. It's a challenge. It's going to grow. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's kind of, but, but discomfort that just feels like it's keep, it's shackling you. That's not good discomfort. Okay. So when you have that shackled tied up, Oh, this is super constrictive. You're going to use a tool called the three B's. So you want to ask yourself, number one, can I bag it? Meaning, can I just stop doing this? And you would be surprised, you know, can I just ignore it? Right. And so Mm -hmm. for instance, with the linen closet example, when I no, I can't ignore, I don't want to ignore it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number two, can I barter it? Now, um, meaning, can I get somebody else to do this for me? Yep. And, uh, sometimes you can. So for instance, I got my kids to order up the sheets, like the linens, cause they were in a jumble. So they had to go in and refold them and put them. I could totally get them to do that. <laughs> but some of the other discernment around what to keep and what to, I couldn't actually, I realized I can't actually barter that. So then the third part, the third B is better it. What can I do here to make the process of handling this better? So for me, what I did in that, and a lot of like, this is the biggest thing that people can do to make experiences better, especially busy, high performing people. Just give yourself more than enough space and time to do Mm -hmm. it. Make a space for it. So I literally booked into my calendar more than enough space. You know, the old me was like, okay, I'm going to give myself 90 minutes. I'm going to get this puppy done. Mm -hmm. No, I'm actually giving myself a full week. And I set aside 30 minutes every day where I can go into that linen closet and just handle a small piece of it. So it's not arduous, but the space is created to look at it. You give yourself more than enough space for me often the way to make things better is just to give yourself space and time, like to create the container inside which to do it. And then it's done. And I usually go for a walk or go do something fun. So I think this is a real, the three B's are a really effective tool to start getting in there and actually addressing the things that are creating the pain points in Mm. our lives. I love it. Martha Beck, she is like a wise sage of our generation. (laughs) She just is. Just a a treasure trove of amazing things. So bag it, barter it, or better it. Um, And, you know, I think sometimes, again, using your words, like, I think this is really important. Create that container for that work. When you have energetically, you feel like you have the space to do what needs to get done. It's amazing how um, motivating that can be. And also think about the things that add a little bit of a fun or playful energy into it. So if there are tasks that I'm avoiding uh, around the house, putting on your favorite playlist, making a cup of tea, you know, just it changing the energy around it. Because again, I think it's the hesitation. It's the, Ooh, if I get it up and out of me kind of energy, then yeah. it's too scary. But if you actually create a container that has a little bit of a different energy, a different vibe to it, you might be surprised what you can get accomplished and a oh, way faster than you actually originally perspe- like perceived, right? And I also think there's beautiful other things starts to happen, Mm -hmm. which is when you're not held hostage by these things, Mm -hmm. two things happen. Number one, you have cultivated the courage of facing things and really taking full ownership for your life experience. Radical responsibility. Radical responsibility. And from that place of radical responsibility, of that practice of courage and the muscle of handling things and giving yourself time and space to handle things, the amount of energy that's unlocked and the willingness and your ability to take, to, to try things, yes, to bring things into your life, to experience levels of richness and satisfaction and meaning you know, and imagine what it's like growing from that place rather than growing from this place of like heaviness where you've got the backpack and everything feels like a slog, Mm -hmm. you know, it truly is like what we're talking about here truly is life transforming. 
you know, one shelf of one linen closet at a time. Or one inbox folder at a time, right? Exactly. Or one drawer yeah. at a time. And so <laughs> this is where I think the work that you do out in the world as a podcaster is quite powerful. So if you like this podcast uh, and you've listened to all the episodes, then of course you're going to want, well, what's next? And I think that this is where your podcast is a lovely um, companion to ours. So your podcast is called Power, Presence, and Position. And those three Ps, in what way could those things really also help us prune the pain points in our work and in our life? Tell us more Mm. about the three Ps. Yeah. This whole podcast, Power, Presence, Position, was really inspired by um, growing up playing squash with my mom. Mm. So my mom was an incredible squash player, um, and she taught me about the power that comes from position. So if you want to dominate in squash, Mm. you want to control, it's a spot in the court called the T. And when you are able to sort of position yourself as close to the T as possible, you are so much, you are positioned to succeed in that game. And I have thought about that you know, and what it comes down to is in your business. And so power presence position is for business women. There are only a few things, you know, it comes down to fundamentals. Um, fundamentally, who are your best customers? Let's prune everybody else. Yes. Fundamentally, what are, what are you best? What is your company best at? Let's prune everything else. Fundamentally, there's only a couple offers that are generating the vast majority of your profits. Let's prune everything else. It really is a show that is dedicated to women founders um, being very discerning about what they bring into the world of their business and creating a very clean and organized world of their company because, you know, money, clarity, money and attention always flow to the place of highest clarity. So Mm. that's like the underlying premise of the show. A lot like simplifiers, Mm -hmm. you know, um, when you really think about it, I think we have our sort of controlling principles, uh, you know, governing ordering principles are are, uh, very similar, Mary. Very aligned. Yeah. And I mean, I think it kind of comes back to kind of like Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule. That, you know, if you actually did an audit uh, for the business owners out there of your um, income, more than likely 80% of your revenue is coming from 20% of your product offerings. And so truly, when you look at it from that kind of a lens, you go, wow, 80% um, is coming from 20% of our efforts. And that's the real power of pruning back because it's not about doing more. It's not about filling your calendar with all the things, back-to-back appointments, et cetera. It's about really discerning what's most important, most powerful, and most valuable, not only to your customers, but to your own life and well-being. It is a game changer. So I encourage you guys, if this piques your interest, head over to Eleanor's websites, eleanorbeaton.com, as well as safi-media.com. Again, all the links are in the show notes over at the simplifierspodcast.com, just to take the next step. And you have a um, thing called Selling with Story. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so one of the key uh, kind of skills. One of the most important, if I prune it down to a skill or a capacity or an ability for any kind of leader to be able to communicate the vision, uh, generate consensus and move people towards some new outcome, whether it's, you're trying to sell something, whether Mm. you're trying to sell a policy, whether you're trying to sell a new procedure, whether you're trying to sell, you know, some form of offering, it's the ability to command the science of attention Yes, to tell great stories. So that's what this tool is. Um, it's a, it's a really fabulous course that brings together about 20 years of kind of storytelling. And it's brilliant and it's free. So we will have the link in the show notes for you guys, for our listeners, um, go over to the simplifierspodcast.com. So as we wrap up, Eleanor, I have a few questions that we'd like to ask everyone that comes on the podcast. And again, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I think it's a so nice. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge it's so nice to hear this kind of wisdom um, in a fresh way, especially this time of year where we're all kind of back to school. It's a new year. We're starting again. There's just that that fresh new beginning. And I hope that 
there are others that are just as inspired as I am um, from our talk today. So my first question for you is this. What's one book or blog that you're reading these days that's either inspiring you or poking holes and challenging your belief system? Well, very in line with the conversation today, um, it's a book called Necessary Endings Mm. by Dr. Henry Cloud. Fantastic book about pruning and about how people don't like ending things, Um, but it is so powerful to be able to do it. So fantastic read. Mm, Love it. I haven't heard that book yet. So again, the link's over the show notes, thesimplifierspodcast.com. So tell me, who is one person in your network, somebody that you know personally, that you just feel is up to brilliant things? We could shine a spotlight on them and who knows, maybe one day we'll have them on the podcast. Yes. Okay. So I have to recommend Tanya Hester. Tanya Hester, um, she wrote a book called Work Optional. She retired at 38. Speaking of pruning, she really inspired me to, she really got me thinking about consumption, Mm. about my purchasing habits, about how that impacts my freedom. She inspired me to start actually going back to the library rather than just Amazon Prime. Imagine that. Um, So Tanya Hester, uh, she is somebody I really would love to see her work be out there even more into the world. Because um, when I think about the, 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 the massively hot summer, the entire Northern hemisphere is having, I think work of women who are really having us take a better look at things like sustainability and how our personal actions inform that. I want to shine as big a light as I can on the work that they're doing. Mm, Yeah. Tanya definitely sounds like a simplifier that we need to have on the podcast very soon. So thank you for that. (laughs) So I believe gratitude goes hand in hand with simplicity Tell me, what are you grateful for today? Mm, I am really grateful for my uh, my husband. Mm. We're celebrating our 20th wedding anniversary next month. I can't even believe that we've been married for 20 years and we're both still alive. Um, and we're still married. Aww. And I am just, uh, that relationship is really a bedrock of, of my life and my work. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful for him. Brilliant. So you can find Eleanor over on Instagram. Eleanor Beaton is her handle there. Again, all the links are in the show notes over the simplifierspodcast.com. My final question for you today is this, Eleanor. Someone somewhere is listening to us right now, and they are kind of going in their head thinking about the things that are really painful in their life right now. And it's a lot. What's one thing you could whisper into their ear right now just to encourage them in this moment? Don't be in a rush to feel better and don't be in a rush to fix it. Mm. Eleanor, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.